Um, regarding my uh, talk today, this is based on a three-year research project which had been funded by the German Ministry of Research and Education uh, uh, entitled Climates of Migration. At that point, let me just set my... I'm not sure I want to in time. Um, collaboration, in collaboration with the Kulturwissenschaftliches Institut in Essen, also uh, study, Advanced Studies uh, Institute, and the focus we had in Munich was on uh, natural disasters and displacement. So this is one uh, uh, strand of um, influence where my uh, interest in this topic comes from. The other is my own work uh, for my second book, um, The History of Flooding of the Ohio River. So I, this is where I will basically draw my examples um, from. Today I will uh, talk about the intersection of environmental migration, uh, environmental change and migration as a new field of research. Uh, basically what topics and issues this new uh, research has generated. That's what I will uh, start with. I will then uh, briefly describe the current debate about so-called climate migration, um, scenarios, uh, terminology and attempts to define this, uh, this, this new uh, phenomenon, if you will. And then the third or rather second uh, large part of my presentation focus on the possible contribution contribution of historical research to this field by looking at several so Until not so long ago, these, these two fields, yeah. environmental history and history of migration, are uh, arguably the two most relevant subfields when it comes to studying environmental migration of the past, have been two almost completely separated fields. This has changed, uh, however, these fields have begun to uh, to overlap, and I swear this is the first time that I've been using two overlapping circles in the <laughs> presentation. Um, I never really liked this, but uh, in this case it seemed to uh, fit quite well. Um, anyway, just a few examples of uh, mm, what has been done recently. Can you see this? Um, this is a book edited by Marco Amiero and Richard Tucker last year, um, dealing with, for example, resettlements, uh, a collection of essays, uh, resettlements through the construction of the Three Gorges Dam in China, um, environmental degradation as a cause of migration in Brazil, or another article by Mark Sokolsky, Migration, Settlement, and Environment in the Russian Far East. Another collection of essays um, edited by uh, two German uh, colleagues, Martin Zuckert and Heidi Klein-Kircher, focusing on migration and landscape transformation in the central and central Eastern Europe. And a couple of years ago, I edited this, uh, this special issue of global environment, also dealing with uh, environmental change and migration. In historical uh, perspective, but altogether this is still a rather heterogeneous and unexplored field. However, certain topics and issues I think have begun to emerge uh, from this kind of research and I will just look at uh, some of them. This is not a complete list, just uh, to uh, highlight a couple of aspects that uh, I think have emerged from this kind of um, research. For example, climate and the environment as pull factor of migration. Um, if you look at the transatlantic migration of the 19th century, uh, for example, and letters sent home by uh, the mass migration to the Americas and uh, letters sent home by migrants, <coughs> you know, almost in every letter find uh, that uh, migrants mention the abundance of resources, the weather and the climate, uh, the soil, flora and fauna. And this has been, I think, a key ingredient, not just in transatlantic uh, communication, um, uh, but it has also contributed to luring millions of Europeans to the new world. Then again, the perception of new environments is uh, important. Migrants often notice that the environment they found was quite different from what they had uh, expected and from what had been advertised to them. Uh, think of Europeans experiencing the first uh, hurricanes for the first time. This is something completely uh, uh, new to them. Although we now have medicaines in the Mediterranean, um, uh, I think there was one recently. Although this is, of course, doesn't come close to uh, the power and the effects of a hurricane. But this was something very unusual. If you read the letters and description of these events, um, but also African Americans coming to the great cities of the North in the Great Migration and experiencing the, the cold in cities like Chicago. This is also something that comes up again and again in letters uh, sent, sent home. Um, the control of micro environments, kind of, to, in order to make them inhabitable. The growth of the Sun Belt can hardly be understood without acknowledging the crucial importance that air condition has had in making places like Phoenix or Las Vegas much more attractive, if not livable, in the first place. Um, and then migrants do not just bring their own bodies to their new homes, but also uh, what could be called environmental and ecological uh, baggage, both in a very material 
way and in immaterial ways. Um, think of memories of landscapes of home countries, for example, immigrants to the US uh, acclimatized non-native species to keep alive memories of the old world's fauna. And I'm quoting from uh, Peter Coates' book. In Cincinnati, for example, German immigrants demanded in 1873 that in order for a bird to be acclimatized in the United States, it should not only be able to eat insects, it should also be a good singer. So again, I think the, the attempt to recreate uh, something they remember from, uh, from their home country. Blind passengers, of course, are part of this baggage too. Whenever humans travel, they are accompanied by plants, animals, uh, microbes, and germs, with uh, sometimes uh, devastating consequences, as we all know, especially for indigenous uh, populations in the Americas. Um, and then there's also close connection between the creation of infrastructural works and uh, labor migration. The most well-known example, I guess, in this country is uh, the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, which uh, would not have been built as quickly and efficiently uh, as it has been without the work of uh, many uh, Chinese immigrants. But um, even for a, a, a much smaller project, like, for example, the, the, the Tato Canal in or near Berlin, just a 30-kilometer waterway, um, more than 2,000 laborers from abroad had to be kind of brought to, uh, to Germany to work on this project. Two-thirds of the entire labor force for this small project, highlighting the importance of uh, imported labor, so to speak. And finally, there is a um, historic link between various kinds of environmental catastrophes and migration slash displacement, which will be the focus of my talk uh, today for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, so why this new interest in the historical intersections between environmental change and migration? Um, as always, I think that current debates trigger interest in historical dimensions of a new uh, phenomenon, if only to find out that it's not as new uh, as, as one, one thought uh, in the beginning. And certainly the current debate about climate migration and climate refugees has contributed greatly to this uh, new interest, um, which is why I would like to take a brief look at this uh, uh, current debate and then relate back to historical examples. Um, climate migration has become a literally a hot topic, with climate change threatening the livelihood of uh, millions of people. The interest has grown in how and why people are being displaced as a result of environmental change. And um, the potential of climate migration as a global problem is uh, breathtaking, as several dramatic scenarios and visualizations uh, seem to indicate. In 1988, for example, the World Watch Institute stated that environmental refugees have uh, had become the single largest class of displaced persons in the world. And they estimated the number of actual environmental refugees <coughs> at that time to be already uh, 10 million. In one of the most influential publications in this field, Norman Myers, in 1995, um, claimed that there were already 20 million refugees, and he predicted 200 million in the long run, not really specifying what the long run uh, would, would be, what it meant. In 2007, and this is the largest number that I have come across, um, the British charity organization Christian Aid even estimated that unless strong preventative action is taken between now and 2050, climate change will push the number of displaced people globally to at least one billion. And as you can imagine, there are also uh, tons of, uh, of visual examples. This is just one from Germany, uh, from Activists Network, a network called Pacific Network from 2013. They produced a postcard um, indicating uh, sea level rise until the year 2100 uh, with this huge uh, red arrow and uh, pointed out what this would mean for this uh, probably small island in the Pacific. It's not, not uh, explicit. This island was destined to drown. Mm. So environmental or climate migration has made it into several major uh, climate change analyses, uh, such as the Stern Review and the IPCC uh, reports. And today, hardly any major publication on climate change fails to address the topic. Um, now, as you can imagine, these numbers and scenarios have been uh, criticized, heavily uh, criticized, for a variety of reasons. Um, I will mention only two. First of all, because uh, in many of these analyses, uh, figures are often based on simply counting the number of people exposed to hazard, um, while 
potential um, measures of adjustment are being ignored, flood control works, for example. And secondly, because uh, the environment was seen as the main driver of migration, whereas mm -hmm. other factors um, also were by and large ignored. So one could say that from its origins in the 1980s until basically today, this debate about uh, environmental migration has been struggling to, uh, to come to terms with its, its topic. And maybe one good reason to illustrate the difficulties in, in, uh, uh, when it comes to defining climate migration or environmental migration is to look at one of the earliest attempts uh, of a definition, one by Esam um, Nawi. This is a very often uh, quoted uh, definition from 1985 in a UN publication, in this case about environmental refugees, where he held that um, uh, environmental refugees are those people who have been forced to leave their traditional habitat temporarily or permanently because of a marked environmental disruption that jeopardized their existence and or seriously affected the quality of their life. But this definition has raised uh, quite a few questions. For example, what does it mean, forced to leave? Um, what about people who left voluntarily, who uh, kind of anticipated uh, a hazard or a, a, a dangerous uh, situation? What is a traditional habitat? Isn't this a rather sedentary perspective that, uh, that kind of ignores societies who are on the move anyway, like pastoral or nomadic uh, societies? Um, well, uh, temporarily or permanently, when does one begin, when does the other one end? When does a, uh, um, uh, a displaced uh, person um, become a permanent migrant? Does it have to take uh, days or weeks or years or even decades? What, what if they come back? Um, and finally, what is a marked environmental disruption? Mm -hmm. um, does this include slow developments or slow violence, uh, as Rob Nixon would say, like, like droughts? Or is it limited to more or less sudden events such as earthquakes or floods? So, so these are questions that are, are still kind of uh, um, defining the debate. Um, and there's really no, uh, um, no consensus. Maybe one can su uh, sum up this, this current debate uh, by saying that it's a debate between uh, maximalists on the one hand and minimalist positions on the other hand. That is between those who think that environmental change is a key driver in migration processes, the maximalists, and those who think that environmental change is a supporting actor at best, the minimalists. And there are many uh, positions in between, of course, as you can. I guess most scholars would locate themselves or situate themselves somewhere in the middle, but, but still, this is uh, uh, the, the width of the field, so to say. And these are just a couple of, of uh, suggestions of how, how to, uh, to um, really label uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the topic, the subject. I will not go through them, but these, these are terms that uh, come up uh, every, every now and then, um, a more or less random selection. So the question is, what is environmental migration and what can history contribute to the current debate? Anthropogenic climate change, after all, is unprecedented. So why should we look back at, at examples that obviously have nothing or maybe uh, just a little to do with uh, what we are facing today? I think that history can contribute in two different ways. First, by highlighting patterns of vulnerability and resilience that are often developed over years, decades or even centuries. Um, and secondly, by writing what you could call histories of the unprecedented. Um, even if current climate change is uh, unprecedented, extreme events such as river floods or hurricanes or typhoons are not. So why not look back and look at similar developments of the past and see uh, and try to analyze the displacement effects that these events had in the past in order to learn something about them. So the second part of my presentation, I will um, uh, try to highlight why people have make, migrated into hazard, uh, so to speak, what brought them there. Um, secondly, I will look at what a German colleague has called circles of displacement and displacement, and uh, then take a closer look at subtle population shifts after catastrophes, as opposed to these, these huge, dramatic, big waves of uh, 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 mass movements of, of people. And then I will come back to my original question of, who, of uh, how this we can contribute to the current debate. I will jump around a little bit in terms of regions and, uh, and time frames. Uh, that's kind of the cost of this, uh, this uh, uh, proceeding. Um, I hope it will not be too confusing. 
But um, if my interest here is in structural elements rather than individual case studies. Um, and uh, as again, I hope that this will work. We'll, we'll see. So, a migration into hazard, uh, uh, kind of. I think that only if we understand what brought people into a hazardous um, region can we fully comprehend the dynamics of disaster-induced mobilities. So why did people move into hazardous areas? I think basically for three reasons. First of all, because they somehow benefited from living there. Secondly, because they didn't know they were living in a hazardous area. And thirdly, because they didn't have a choice, because they, they were pushed into risk, so to speak. The first case is, I um, think, pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, benefits out by costs, not in the sense of a, a cost engineer benefit cost analysis, but rather in the sense that um, uh, settlers, for example, benefited from fertile land in a, in a floodplain, um, uh, uh, from the fact that rivers facilitate transportation, are a source of energy, food and power, and so on. Um, so quite often, a society prone to damage and displacement by floods was willing to take the risk in order to reap the benefits of ecosystem services, if you want to call it that. Um, secondly, uh, another reason for um, settlement in risky locations is what might be called environmental ignorance, the fact that uh, people didn't know or don't know that they're living in a, a dangerous uh, spot, the lack of concrete knowledge about local environmental parameters. And this is especially true for settler societies um, where mostly European immigrants had hardly any experience with the land that they claimed and by and large ignored the traditional ecological knowledge of the native uh, populations. There are uh, tons of examples for this, but um, the result was um, that they often paid the price for these uh, kind of, um, well, risky strategies or uh, this lack of knowledge. This is just an example from my own research. This is uh, a, a painting of the town of Alexandria on the Ohio River, which um, uh, was basically being washed away a few years after it had been founded, um, uh, as this kind of chronicler has um, uh, written almost a century after the event. Alexandria grew very rapidly until it was discovered that the Ohio River was too frequent in its visits and driving the population to the hills for protection against the watery element. Alexandria went down, which it was bound to do on an account of its creation. And there are several stories of, of early uh, settlements being either washed away or destroyed, rebuilt, and so on, uh, because of a lack of intergenerational knowledge. Yeah. The interesting thing about this painting is that it's, uh, it's a painting on a flood wall, it's a mural, um, a flood wall to protect the city of Portsmouth, which is located above where Alexandria used to be, um, <laughs> and still was devastated by the 37 Ohio flood, 1937 Ohio flood indicating this uh, trial and error process of settlement, uh, at least in this region and in many other regions um, as well. Um, and thirdly, people have been uh, kind of pushed into environmental risk. There's a strong uh, connection between uh, marginal lands and marginalized uh, populations. Jennifer Bonnell has um, uh, uh, stated this very eloquently in her book on the Don River, uh, Toronto's Don River, where she held that few studies investigate the congregation of marginalized populations in already degraded spaces or in uh, urban rural borderlands. Even fewer explore the link between homeless people and degraded environments. From her own research of the Don Valley, she mentions, for example, that this uh, river valley has, uh, has been used as a place for squatters in the 1830s as a campsite for Roma travelers in the 19-teens mm. and 20s, and as a so-called hobo jungle during the Great uh, Depression. Mm. So these marginal spaces, it seems, have often been the last refuge for marginalized parts of the population. But there's another angle to it, to this uh, connection between these two forms of uh, marginality, um, an aspect that we are only able to see if we take an historical look, I think. And this is what uh, Anna Harms, a German anthropologist, has called um, circuits of emplacement and displacement. Because um, quite often it is exactly those people who already have a history of migration or a history of displacement who find themselves uh, in vulnerable situations and places again. Let me just go through a couple of examples. Landless peasants mm -hmm. from his own work. Um, this is where he got this idea from, from his own research in uh, as I said, anthropologist, so did uh, research in the Genghis uh, uh, Delta. Um, and his example is the island of Loa Chara, which actually can't 
uh, see it's right here, it has been uh, vanished since. Um, one of the Char Islands situated in the Indian part of the Bay of Bengal. Um, and these islands have attracted migrants um, who had nowhere else to go but to these extremely vulnerable places and uh, are subject to um, constant processes of, of erosion, of damage by floods and typhoons and, and so on. Um, so this island has, has been completely washed away and uh, um, the settlers were kind of resettled on nearby islands but they were resettled on the outermost part of those islands and thus were vulnerable to, to displacement again. And so he came up with this concept of uh, circus of um, uh, emplacement and displacement. Other examples, um, labor markets, for example, in Florida, many of the 2,000 victims of the 28 hurricane, 1928 hurricane, were migrants from the Caribbean and other places who had just come to the Lake Okeechobee region to work as field laborers in the recently drained area. And um, Vanport, Oregon, uh, I think it's a, a, a just uh, flew in uh, yesterday from, from Portland. Um, I talked to an archivist yesterday morning about this, this flood, uh, about what materials they have. Uh, Vanport was founded as a huge public housing project in 1943 to accommodate thousands of workers who had uh, come to the region to work for uh, wartime industries, most importantly the Kaiser Shipbuilding uh, Company. It was constructed between the city limits of, of Portland and the Columbia River on uh, reclaimed bottomlands. And this uh, settlement or town, uh, nicknamed Kaiserville, was entirely inundated by a flood in 1948 and was never rebuilt, so it existed for only six years. Um, and at that time, uh, the time it was flooded, uh, still 18,000 people lived there, down from a wartime peak of 40,000, um, uh, and many of them African Americans. Um, so, so the question of what happened to them is still a uh, history that has yet to be. Uh, to be written and to be told. Um, it's, it's a question of uh, again, space because the, the entire, uh, it's a lost city kind of city that it's existed for only six years. Um, but again, it's, it's um, telling of the connection between emplacement and displacement. As I said, I would be jumping quite a bit, and I'm, I'm now I'm, uh, I'm coming to one example from, from, from Europe. Um, and in the conclusion, I will tell you uh, why this is important too. Um, urban floodplains in Europe after the war, after World War II, served as uh, a refuge for quite a few of uh, quite a few raw refugees, so-called Vertriebene from the former eastern uh, areas of Germany, um, who had to be integrated into the West German uh, society. And this is the case, for example, in Hamburg Wilhelmsburg, the biggest uh, inhabited river island in uh, Europe where many of these uh, Vertriebene, uh, these uh, displacings, lived in the so-called Behelfsheim, temporary unstable homes with no second story, which turned out to be a problem in 1962 when uh, the Elbe hit Hamburg, a uh, storm surge from the, from, uh, from the North Sea, um, pushing water into all the way uh, into the Elbe River all the way up to Hamburg. Um, and more than 200 people died in Wilmsburg alone, uh, by far, uh, many more than in any other, other part of town. So in all of these cases, uh, the people who were exposed to various kinds of displacement already had a history of forced or voluntary mobility and, and so remained more vulnerable than others to uh, renewed processes of displacement. Um, when we think of disaster and displacement, I think we tend to think of uh, the, the mass movement of people, large waves of uh, migration, um, maybe even of resettlements and relocations. Uh, however, uh, the relocation of an entire community is historically a rather um, rare occurrence, I would say. It has happened uh, quite a few times, especially after earthquakes. Um, Antigua, Guatemala has been removed three times before it was rebuilt on its present site. Um, more recently, however, the relocation of entire communities after a natural disaster seems to have affected predominantly small places like, uh, for example, Shawneetown in Illinois, a, a small town of 2,000 people, which uh, for more than a century has withstood uh, the annual overflowings of the Ohio River until in 37, again, this was a 1,000 uh, year event, um, it was more or less completely destroyed by the flood and uh, uh, the city decided to, uh, to relocate itself, or rather to be relocated by the WPA and 14 other new deal agencies just a few miles up the hill. 
and it's now called New Shawnee Town, and um, uh, it's, it's a process of slow erosion rather than, than a tra transplantation, uh, so to speak, because quite a few people decided to stay in the old Shawnee Town. But this is an example rather than the norm, I think. Mm. What is uh, more important are subtle population shifts, subtle and long-term population shifts within places that have been hit by disaster. If you go back to, uh, so this is just another example of, of New Shawnee Town, how it was rebuilt um, basically, as I said, three miles up the hill. If you go back to, uh, uh, to the Hamburg flood of uh, 1962, the example I just mentioned, and take a look at what has happened the 20, uh, 20 plus years after the event, it's interesting to note that according to this uh, article from the uh, Hamburg Allgemeine Nachrichten, um, I will not read it to you, I will uh, kind of paraphrase the most important things. Um, this has been taken from a beautiful book by Felix Mauch, I don't know in this very flat, not related to another Mauch we, uh, we know, um, just uh, uh, to be sure. So this, this, art, uh, this news, newspaper article um, uh, diagnosed a deterioration of living conditions, Verschlechterung der Lebensverhältnisse, the outmigration of unsatisfied citizens, unzufriedene Bürger, um, in migration of foreigners, uh, how do they phrase it? Altsidischen Mitbürger, what this refers to is mostly guest workers whom the West German state increasingly hired in the 60s and 70s. Um, and in general, a fundamental change of the social structure of the neighborhood as a result of the flood. Or at least partly as a result of, of the flood. So the change in the composition of the population uh, as a result of processes of abandonment, neglect, social erosion of that area. And, um, this is an isolated example. I think this is something that we can uh, detect in many other uh, cities as well that have been hit by natural uh, catastrophes like um, Cincinnati, Ohio, again, the 37 flood. Several communities uh, along the Ohio witnessed similar processes uh, after the flood. In Cincinnati, for example, the residential areas of the floodplains were basically uh, given up. So this is downtown Cincinnati. This is uh, the Kentucky side of the river. Um, the flood, of course, and this is true for all the examples I mentioned, was not the only reason for uh, these developments uh, to happen, but the intentional neglect of this area by city planners after 37 certainly played an important role. Um, however, to some, this, this was, uh, uh, some people saw this as an opportunity rather than a problem. Ernest P. Goodrich, for example, in New York City, engineer and uh, who had been hired as an advisor to the Cincinnati City Planning uh, Commission, viewed this disaster as a unique opportunity to reappraise the whole city plan, to amend and improve it where such is found desirable, and thus to provide for an even better future Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, um, this project served most of all to make the waterfront area in the Mill Creek Valley, west of downtown, car-friendly. Mostly, um, the flood was used by city planners and, and, and by others as a slum clearance uh, device, as a welcome opportunity to uh, achieve uh, their goals. The Cincinnati Times Star noted on April 16, 1952, that residents of the bottom, bottoms lived on borrowed time, and sooner or later they would have to go. And this is what happens, so just, just a, a quick overview, um, a long story cut very short. This is 1946. Um, Metropolitan master plan with all the ingredients of high modernism like highways and stadium, uh, parks, uh, and so on, a couple of high rises. That's the way it should be. This is what, uh, what had to go a shanty town in the Mill Creek area, not, not the downtown area. I couldn't find images in the downtown area, but um, uh, the Mill Creek Valley, west of downtown, which uh, very industrialized and uh, inhabited valley, which suffered from the Ohio River backing up into this uh, smaller creek. Um, this is an image of the uh, 1997 flood where the entire area is basically uh, a huge uh, parking lot, uh, uh, a wasteland except for the Riverfront Stadium, which was open during that flood uh, for event parking, so you could watch the flood from, from the Riverfront uh, Stadium uh, because it was built in a flood-proof way. Um, and this is what the area looks like today. Huge development project, the banks, um, so totally different uh, uh, Three different uh, land use with stadiums for the uh, rats and uh, bangles and public park and museum uh, and uh, so, so on. Um, so 
So these and many other examples uh, show that slow and long-term developments are important when um, uh, are important too, and how they are also related to issues of environmental justice. Sometimes, however, natural disasters can also be used as an opportunity by those who are affected by it. And the 27 Mississippi flood, I think, is a very good example uh, of this. Oops, sorry. Oh, this is just uh, um, uh, to show you that this was not, not Cincinnati was not the only uh, city to suffer from these developments. This is uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where um, the Point area was transformed into a park after the flood. And similarly in Frankfurt, not located on the Ohio directly, uh, but also suffering from the flood. Uh, sorry for the privileges. Uh, as uh, uh, D.A. Boyd has pointed out, Crawfish Bottom, a low-income neighborhood, had to go uh, and uh, be... Uh, was replaced by more or less government, uh, by basically government uh, buildings. Um, uh, but I'm now will briefly talk about the 27 Mississippi flood, a flood that forced about 700,000 people out of their homes, about half of them African Americans, and uh, quite a few used this opportunity to escape the Jim Crow conditions in the South. And from this perspective, um, as Richard Mazel has pointed out, mobility is also akin to freedom and the decision to migrate after the 27 flood represented powerful acts of individual and group as expression. Um, highlighting the fact that mobility and migration are not just problems, sometimes they are also solutions to, uh, to, to, to a different uh, kind of uh, problem. However, um, this was the exception rather than the norm during uh, this flood. Um, while thousands of African Americans left the South, the majority could not and did not migrate. This is a phenomenon that uh, Helen Adams and others have conceptualized as uh, trapped uh, populations. Um, because quite a few plantation owners were afraid of a mass exodus of, uh, of farm workers and went to great lengths to make them stay by various means. Uh, many African Americans, for example, were forced to work on the levee, often at gunpoint. Um, <coughs> also, unlike the white population, African Americans only received food and clothing from the Red Cross if they agreed to stay within one of the 154 uh, tent cities that the relief organization in the flooded areas uh, has um, had built. Uh, Michelle has called this uh, the, the islanding effect. Uh, I mean, she talks about uh, the earthquake in Haiti, but I think it, it uh, describes the situation uh, at the Lower Mississippi uh, quite well. As well, the ironing effect in which the mobility poor are marooned in the disaster zone, while those with high network capital come and go as they please. So it's important not just to look at the dynamics that uh, catastrophes produce, but also at the static elements, uh, uh, so to speak, at the importance of place dependence uh, rather than displacement. Okay, um, coming back to uh, the question why look back, what, what, what sense does it make to use history uh, to, uh, to, to look at historical examples of these uh, kinds of um, events? First of all, I think that history is able to provide an in-depth analysis as opposed to these rather uh, dramatic uh, scenarios. Mm, to look at small-scale events of the past allows us to counter sensationalist accounts and paint a more accurate picture of uh, developments that are going on, not at least because we have uh, what you could call high resolution data um, as a story. I mean, if we find uh, good material, uh, good holdings, and a good archive, then we can uh, describe these developments in much greater detail than a lot of the current literature on the uh, subject is able to do. Um, However, this complexity also produces methodological problems uh, in the sense that um, often several forms of migrations overlap. The 27 Exodus, of course, was, was part of the great migration of, of uh, African Americans moving north, and nobody knows um, whether or not they had been able to migrate, had not the great migration already produced uh, infrastructure, uh, knowledge systems, uh, destinations, routes, uh, and so on. Uh, so in this way they are clearly uh, connected. Secondly, I think, um, of course, as an historian, that the long delay, the, the long term perspective is, is important, it's a great asset in uh, analyzing environmental migration, uh, both of today and of the past, because uh, they are often embedded in many long term uh, processes, and these processes shape, for example, 
patterns of vulnerability and resilience, the paths and destinations of movement, uh, and the importance of uh, place attachment and place dependence. Um, thirdly, I'm not exactly sure about this one, but I, I think it, it might make sense. I think uh, an historical look at uh, um, uh, environmentally induced migrations of the past can contribute to provincializing uh, the west of the global north, following on up in uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti's work. Uh, work. Um, Greg Bankoff has convinced, convincingly argued that vulnerability to natural hazards has replaced poverty as the new dangerous condition, as, as he uh, calls it. However, as an historical analysis shows, this uh, vulnerability is not endemic to, uh, to countries in the global south, but can be found in all parts of the world. What is different is, of course, uh, uh, the, the coping capability of a certain country. I mean, think of the Netherlands and uh, a country that is basically under the sea level, two-thirds of the country under the sea level, still it works quite well, one, one could argue, so there are ways to, to deal with this problem, other than to migrate um, or to be displaced. Um, and then finally, and I will end by, uh, by this, I think it's not just, uh, um, uh, it's not just uh, uh, the legitimization of this uh, historical look at uh, environmental migrations. Uh, it's not just that we can contribute to, uh, to the current debate, but it's a genuine field of research, I think. Um, and what we are seeing is only the tip of the iceberg, I hope, uh, of uh, much more research uh, coming out, for example, the culture of environmental migration, there's, there's not hardly anything out there yet, um, on the importance of insurance uh, and migration, to mention just uh, two examples of um, up and coming research, maybe. And I will 